I'm excited that everybody's going to spend a couple hours talking about this. I think it's a very important topic that probably doesn't get enough discussion sometimes, and it actually helps save us quite a bit in the long run. I'm going to start by just introducing myself to you guys and telling you a little bit about me. I've been around for a long time. I've been in clinical research now for, this is my 20th year. I'm now telling people that I started when I was five, just so that I don't age myself too terribly. I was pretty young when I did start, but not quite that young. I've been at pharma companies, I've been at CROs, I've been at IRBs, and now I'm in the consulting world. So seen a lot of different things, hosted a lot of regulatory inspections and a lot of site audits and that sort of thing. So my, my main area of expertise is GCP quality assurance, and, and I really enjoy helping folks understand the concepts better and, and really apply them to what they do. I've never met anyone in clinical research who you know, just tells me, oh gosh, I really want to come in and do a terrible job. Today. Most people want to do a great job. I applaud you. I know that you guys work super, super hard, and so I'm really excited to talk about this with you. We have a lot to get through in this couple of hours, so we will move quickly, but I really want everybody to ask questions. All right, so here are our learning objectives for today. So we're going to describe the components of a protocol deviation, of protocol deviation documenting and reporting. So we're going to talk about all the pieces and parts. We're going to identify the individual roles in the management of protocol deviations, because there are a lot of different roles in that process. And we're going to utilize a process to proactively identify, track, and evaluate deviations for greater effectiveness in study management. So we're going to figure out how to identify them, keep up with them, and know what to do with them, which are kind of the three big things, because they're definitely going to happen. And all of the clinical trials, everybody's going to have a deviation at some point. I have never actually audited a site, been to a site, looked at any data where there wasn't at least one deviation, whether it's not a window visit, whether it's you know, I forgot to mark this thing on this page or document this other thing here. Maybe I entered things late into the EDC. There, there are all kinds of things that can happen, it's just, and it's going to. And, and no regulatory authority or auditor who has any level of sanity whatsoever is going to tell you that you should have a perfect study. In fact, we really worry when it is perfect, we get very concerned because that means you're probably making things up. So <laughs> a couple of mistakes are going to happen, <laughs> and that's okay. So we want to focus on what the most important things are, right? We don't want to strain a gnat and swallow a camel. We want to identify the things that matter, not worry too much about the things that don't matter, and take it from there. We also want to make sure we don't repeat it, right? When it happens, it's no longer just a deviation, but a practice. And my favorite thing is it's a systemic noncompliance. So it's something that's systematically going bump in the night every single time. And we don't want those things. We want to make sure that we're running ahead of it whenever we can. And you know, the good news is there's a lot that we can do that is both corrective and proactive. My favorite is proactive because then we don't have to be corrective, which takes more time, right? So we want to kind of be ahead of the curve. So identifying deviations. How in the heck do you know if you have a deviation to begin with? This is a very good question, and we're going to answer it. So you guys tell me what you think without cheating, so don't look at your handouts for this. But how do you, what do you think the ICH definition of a deviation is? And you can pop that into the chat box. I think that is not protocol compliant. Yeah. So are we saying that the ICH definition is that things are not protocol compliant? And I meant to write not following protocol. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so is that our general consensus for everybody else who's on the phone and not in the room? Yes. 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 Excellent. I would say that that's pretty good high level at ICH version. How do you think the uh, U.S. Code of Federal Regulations would define a deviation? The same, I think. Is it the same? We just took GCT no, in a, in a very wondering. wordy way, generally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Federal regulations are really very wordy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, they are very legal speaky, aren't they? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I would say overall that's correct. They definitely use more words than I think maybe are necessary, but sometimes they don't use enough words. I have to say, ICH uses better quality words than FDA does on some things. Sometimes ICH is a bit more clear of the two sets of 
items, my personal favorite is ICH, which probably says something about me, and you all should be quite worried that I have a favorite when it comes <laughs> to regulatory documentation. But then again, that's what makes me good at quality, right? <laughs> so you guys are completely correct. Any deviation or you know, departure from the protocol, anything that the protocol says you're supposed to do is going to be considered a deviation. 